Welcome to another uh, class in the bunker. Uh, we're actually running down on these. Uh, we're going to be taking a break uh, for the summer. Uh, so today's class and then next week's class will be, uh, will get us right up against the summer break and then we will be restarting again um, the week after Labor Day. So uh, if you haven't had a chance to go back and look at all these classes, Hey, it'll give you a chance to get caught up. Uh, we put a number of them out here uh, through this entire year and uh, had a, a great time doing it. So um, hopefully you enjoy these last couple. Again, always hit like and share and uh, so that uh, we can kind of do our little outreach to everybody and a number of you are just hitting share and really kind of putting this out. So thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, now as we get started today, I'm going to borrow a little bit from uh, some words of uh, a BYU professor from a couple of uh, decades ago, Eugene England, uh, who has some great thoughts that really mesh with, I think, where we are uh, in a church moment uh, right now. Over the last uh, uh, year, uh, we're recording this in uh, 2021, we've lived through a, a pandemic. And during the pandemic, uh, we ceased all kind of church oper uh, operations, brought us in-house, come follow me. It was just a sacrament meeting at home. And, uh, and then in the last uh, six to eight months, we begin rolling all of that back. And now we're in that uh, process now of going from what is our own little sacrament meetings at home to uh, being back at church. And it's interesting when you talk to people, uh, certainly I, I've had some similar feelings. There's a little bit of ambivalence, uh, quite honestly, with... Uh, on one side, being able to be back at church with people, in a lot of cases, uh, seeing people we haven't seen for uh, a long time and like old acquaintances getting reconnected and that's awesome. At the same time, there's a little bit missing because we kind of enjoyed uh, having time uh, with our own family, our own sacrament meetings, uh, felt like Sundays were a little bit less rushed uh, it was pretty great as far as, as that went. So we've got that mix uh, between the two and, uh, and I think it's going to bring us up against uh, one other thing and that's this. Here's what Eugene, Eugene England had said. When we think about attending church, do we see ourselves as servants or consumers? Servants or consumers? And, and let's talk a little bit about uh, kind of where he went with that and why he would come up with that idea. With consumers, uh, let's take, for instance, I don't know, that maybe you have a little restaurant that sells chicken that you do really, really well. And in fact, you're really good, like at Chick-fil-A, of doing uh, very simple straightforward uh, chicken, not a really big menu. Uh, you you um, run people through your very busy restaurant better than the military would do it. And you have this incredible sauce that everybody gets hooked to enough that not only do they want them at the, uh, at the chicken restaurant, but they're also willing to go buy them in the store because they can't get enough of the Chick-fil-A sauce. Well, we have told Chick-fil-A <coughs> how much we like their restaurants and how much we like their sauce and how much we like their service. We told them by voting with our feet. We told them by voting with our money. And so in the, in the process of all of that, we, um, we, as consumers, we will vote for what we like and we will vote against what we don't. If we don't like a restaurant, we'll quit going and they will see their numbers decline. Uh, if we like certain products, we'll buy more of them. If we like a certain movie, we'll go purchase it. If we don't, as consumers in a capitalistic society, we say we will vote elsewhere. And, and in a capitalistic society, they get the hint pretty fast 
whether we are voting yay or nay, whether we like them or we don't. Uh, and we will do it because when we go to a restaurant, it is kind of, we may enjoy being with people, but it really ruins it if we don't like the food. So to a certain extent, it's really about me. It's, it's about, I'm going to go eat where I want to eat. I'm going to watch the movies I want to watch. Uh, and I will make sure that I am taking care of me and I will avoid things I don't like. Uh, and nobody understands that more than online people like Google and Amazon. If you're worried about the government having too much information on you, I would, I would worry less about the government and more about Amazon. They probably know you better than you know yourself. They know what you buy. They know what kind of products you like. They know when you're going to buy them. They know what you tend to look otherwise for, what kind of entices you, what kind of ads you respond to, uh, as does Google in their uh, search optimization. They know what you like and they know what you're looking for and they know what you'll respond to. Again, probably more than you know yourself because they see you as a consumer. If they can feed opinions, beliefs, products, pictures, websites based on what you consume, they get to make money off of that. So they see you as a consumer because they see you taking care of you. You want to take care of your needs, your wants, your ideas, and it's their job to provide that, okay? That's what we do as consumers. And again, if we don't like products or services or websites, we don't attend to them, we quit, we quit buying, we quit purchasing, and Google and Amazon and others will quit trying to get us to entice and find out what our new interests are. That's what consumers do. Now, we have a tendency, because we are in that consumer mode, to do that when it comes to a church. And, and so what happens is, is that in church settings, people attend church often the way that they consume products. I'm going to go to a church of my choice, or if I'm LDS, I'll go to my ward, uh, because I like my friends, and I like the people, or I like what I'm hearing, or I like the bishop, or, or whatever. I'm just used to doing it. The interesting thing, though, is that because our consumerism is never far away, we also are very quick to vote with our consumer feet to say, I don't like this, or I don't like that, or I don't like that part of theology, and I, or I don't like what's happening in my war, or I don't like, I don't like, I don't like, and I will vote and not attend. I'm leaving church because I just can't go with this political view, or this doctrine, or this historical thing, or that church leader, and I'm going to vote as a consumer not to be there. And instead, what we have a tendency to do then is to say, uh, I still have a yen for uh, spiritualism, and because of that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to search my consumer mind for places that I feel more at peace, I feel more one, and it comes closer to what I think and feel, and, and so I'm, I'm going to do that. And so that's why, uh, by and large, I saw a survey just this week that said 44% uh, of millennials don't believe in God in any way, shape, or form. They're just done. So now 60% of millennials believe in God in some way, and then a small portion of them actually attend churches based on that, because most of that 60% will tell you that they're spiritual. The other 40% say it's all hokum anyway, and I have voted my little consumerness out of that whole arena because I think the whole thing is dumb. Now, when, when, uh, when Eugene England wrote a fabulous uh, article called Why the, the Church is as True as the Gospel, one of the things that he found most fascinating about and most brilliant, he thought, in terms of our church 
organization was the very thing that probably drives a number of us nuts. And that is our, our pension since Nauvoo for LDS geographic wards. When you move to a new area, you know, just by consulting a map, what ward you'll go to. You'll know that geographically, you're, this ward encompasses these neighborhoods, this area, this town, and that's, and you will, so at nine o'clock, you're supposed to be at your LDS ward coming from your geographical area. This is opposed to when we first moved to Texas from Utah, and, and uh, in our very first week, people would say, oh, you just moved. Yes, we do. And, and they're very, they very quick to say, y'all found your church home, meaning that you're here, you move states, now you're going to start look, looking for a church home. Meaning what? I like, I like that denomination. I like that minister. I like that choir. They have a fabulous youth group. Uh, they do these kind of things, this kind of service or not. They believe in this shade of this doctrine or not. And so the idea is always in, uh, in so many areas without this geographical restriction, you're going to vote with your feet. And people tend to vote and place themselves in settings, be they groups or wards or churches or denominations or faith with people like them that look like them, sound like them, oftentimes very close uh, economically as well, where you are on socioeconomic uh, scale you're going to actually end up work, worshiping with people that are pretty much like you when you vote like that. Now, the LDS geographic construction messes with all of that. Now, so how does that, how does that work? How does that look? Well, the result is that when we attend our LDS congregation. We actually do worship with people that we like. I was, I was glad uh, on this Sunday to see again people I hadn't seen in a long time and, and people that I really truly like and so it, it was a joy uh, to kind of reconnect with people. And we tend to worship with people that are very much like us in a lot of ways. Uh, as empty nesters, we tend to kind of spend a little bit more time with other empty nesters. Young families in our ward will tend to spend time more with other young families that are like them because we have commonalities and interests. Uh, I tend to hang out with those that like to barbecue because uh, I like what they, what they cook up uh, and they like what I cook up. We tend to worship with those that are like us. And the, again, the beauty of an LDS setting is that we don't just attend, we serve. And we're going to serve in callings with people that maybe weren't our friends, but become our friends. Or perhaps we choose to serve in settings uh, or call as other associates or counselors to us, our friends. Uh, and that, that makes it a very enjoyable thing. Now, but because of our geographical restrictions, here's the genius that Brother England spotted. And he said, we also worship with people we may not like very much. There they are in that same geographical area and we're plugged into being with them. We may not, so we end up worshiping with people that if we look across the congregation, there may be some aspects of them that we don't like very much. They may be on the other end of the political spectrum. And we're not sure that we agree with everything that they agree with. Or we, didn't, we may not like the way that they raise their kids or don't raise their kids. Or whether they had too many kids or not enough kids or whatever restrictions we are putting on it that says we're going to worship, but we're worshiping with people if we're going to be really honest that we don't like. Now, because it's an LDS setting, guess what? 
We end up worshiping with people we would have never met or served any time with in any other way. They just, we wouldn't have run in the same circles. Especially a ward that may be larger geographically, and so you're going to get professional people mixing with, with farmers, and you're going to get uh, blue-collar people mixing with white and, and in the course of their consumeristic lives, they might have never come in contact with those people other than maybe in some professional setting. But now we worship side by side. And we're going to have to not just be in the same room with or not just say hi to them, but work alongside them. Okay? Because now we're going to serve with and oft times under the very people that drive us nuts. We're trying to get away from them, we get called into the same presidency. The guy that we thought was so obnoxious got called as our bishop. Or as our ministering, ministering brother, we just can't get loose of this guy. And, and there we are, and we're, and we're trapped. And they bought a house, and we bought a house, and with, with few things changing, we're going to be in this geographical stirring pot with these Nice people, good people, happy people, like people, unlike people, obnoxious people, people that drive us nuts, people with different viewpoints on things. We just can't get away from these guys. And they want us to happily love and serve one another. All one big happy. Now, not only that, but I may not like somebody or I may struggle with something about them but I may be called to give a blessing to that person. Somehow, some way, I'm supposed to conjure up peaceful heart and perform a blessing where the spirit can be unrestrained on somebody that I have differences with. And, and the, the Lord's response, as it oft times is, to a stake president who is handling request can can we just move wards our friends are over there can we just be the, no no you need to you need to grow where you were planted you need to lift where where you are but i don't want to do that yeah i know <laughs> but here you are and it's the lord's plan uh and and like the Holy Spirit, it will comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. And there we are. Uh, and it's one of the beautiful parts of the gospel that we end up in these situations. So what it requires us to do is, to, is that we're going to disagree with the disagreeable. And, and darn it, we have to learn to love them anyway. And the consumer... Part of our natural man and woman says, I don't want to consume what they're selling. I don't want to consume them. And then a very odd things happen. And that is that the longer that we end up serving with the disagreeable, we begin to find out that maybe we love them more than we thought we did that there were some aspects of that prism of, of uh, personality quirks and opinions that we begin to find some real beauty in there. And, and that's what it is that the Lord would have us begin to deal with. And that's the moment, brothers and sisters, where perhaps we begin to shift and where we need to shift from attending church as a consumer to attending church as a servant. As galling <laughs> as that might be. So, in reality, we often talk about our own personal righteousness. And our job is to 
get us to heaven or get our family to heaven or exalt us. And so we're going to work on being as good as we can be and keeping the commandments and going to sacrament meeting and checking and seeing how, how am I doing on the worthiness scale and, you know, and how much of the atonement do I need this week. Maybe I don't need very much because I've been darn good uh, this week because it's about me and getting me to the right place. And um, as, a, uh, as a brilliant comic once said, uh, Brian Regan, Beware the me monster. The gospel consistently talks, though, not about exalting individuals, but exalting families. And some of the people we dislike the most are blood or, or by law. We call them in-laws. We have by law they are our relatives. But exalting that group of people, that disparate group of people, and communities. There are no Zion people. There are Zion communities, Zion families, and we are to be exalted in a relationship one to another. Nobody makes it on their own, though sometimes in our worship we want to make it about our own. So, relationships are exalted, and individuals are not. Relationships are exalted. Individuals can only be exalted by becoming transformed. How? Through healing relationships. First of all, with our Savior, and our relationship, Him to us, and then us to Him. As He exalts us? No. He exalts our family, us as a couple, our community. For all of our likes and dislikes. As Brother England would uh, go on to, to say, it is in the church especially that those with the gifts of, and then he lifts, he, he lifts, he, he lists these wonderful gifts, vulnerability, pain, handicap, need, and look where he goes, ignorance, intellectual arrogance. <laughs> you ever thought about having to serve in a calling with somebody who has the spiritual gift of intellectual arrogance? What a blessing that is to you to have to figure out how you navigate this wonderful brother with intellectual arrogance. <laughs> Thank you so much for that calling. Um, social pride. The gift of social, social pride. Prejudice. What are we going to learn from having to serve along somebody with prejudice and not consumerly running away? And sin. That both our sin and their sin end up being spiritual gifts in the way that they are giving something to us, in the way that we have to interact and relate to those people. That's sweeping to me. When I first read that, I was just amazed. It is in the church especially with those of the gift of vulnerability, pain, handicap, need, ignorance, intellectual arrogance, social pride, even prejudice and sin. In my little geographical piece of the world that I have to serve and serve with and serve under can be accepted, learned from, helped, and made part of the body of Christ so that together we can all be blessed. We need those obnoxious people as <laughs> much as we would really rather that we didn't. Now, maybe the, one of the best ways to uh, demonstrate this, let's quickly go to, for just a second to Mount Sinai. Uh, the children of Israel parked in front of Mount Sinai. And remember last time that we were talking about the fact that um, 
they really didn't want to deal with God face to face. They would rather that Moses did that for them uh, because the fire techniques on top of the mountain were a little frightening. And you do it and let us know how that goes. That would make things great. Okay? Now, from Mount Sinai and from the Law of Moses comes the Decalogue, the Basic Ten. What are these people supposed to do maybe differently than what they were doing in Egypt under slavery? And these we know pretty well and we have court battles, whether they can even be posted uh, in our city parks. And what we got was the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods beside me. You shall make no carved likeness. Don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to hallow it. Honor your father and mother. You shall not murder. Commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't bear, bear false witness. And there it is. We carve it in. Don't, don't be doing these things, he says. Now, isn't it interesting that a couple of times when the Savior during his ministry is asked, what are the great commandments? Wouldn't your mind automatically go to the Big Ten? Those are the, there, there it is. Those are the really, really good, big, important commandments. What did the Savior say? Jesus replied to that question and he said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. That last word incidentally coming out of Deuteronomy, uh, the, the word almost defies uh, explanation uh, because the best way to almost say this is love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your oomph. It, it's, a, and it's, it's almost an expression of <sighs> intensity that defies a word and it's, and it's translated several different ways but think of that in this case okay now isn't it fascinating that the first commandment he takes the first half of the Decalogue because all of these the love your love your God the gods beside me no carbon are all about loving God with all of our oomph and we're supposed to start there. Then he says, this is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like unto it. This is as big as this one. What is that? Well, remember, he's going to actually take the, the bottom half of the Decalogue, all these out here, and say, love your neighbor as yourself. Loving them is as big as loving me. And then the statement is, all the law and all the prophets hang on these two commandments. I almost wonder if we would have less worry if in our public areas, rather than putting the Ten Commandments, what if, what if we said, we're going to put up something that says, love God your way and love your neighbor? I think very few people would have problem with that one. And that's basically what Jesus was, that was his gospel. And all the things that come from that, all the things that we know about exaltation and ordinances and priesthood and all that kind of stuff actually ends up being subsumed under love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. And I'll exalt thee and thee exalt me and we shall be exalted together. Even though you're kind of obnoxious sometimes. I hear that sometimes in my marriage counseling stuff. I love him, but he drives me nuts. I love her, but I don't like her very much at the moment. I get it. I understand that. Okay? Now, this basis 
actually goes all the way back to the law of Moses, by the way. Uh, the Savior was actually quoting the Old Testament. He, wasn't, he actually didn't make this up in front of those people. He was actually going back to Leviticus, which said, You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin. Not him. <laughs> that, didn't that make it worse? He's the obnoxious one, and I'm the one that's sinning. I didn't come up with the stupid idea. He did, and yet I'm the one that sins if I'm not able to find a way to love him. Well, thank you, Lord, for these great opportunities for patience and, and, and uh, character building, uh, if you will. Okay? Lo Don't hate your, your brother in your heart lest you incur sin, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then, and then like the notary seal put on top of that. I am the Lord. <sighs> I have spoken. And there it is, carved in stone. You don't get any more authoritarian, authoritative than that. Okay? So... I understand as we are in this process of going back to church or that you've been attending a church or a setting for a long time and you're, and you're not always getting fed very much or sacrament meetings are pretty boring or, or the bishop, you know too much about his family. To be honest, I'm not really getting much out of attending church these days. I was having more fun at home. And now they want me to go back. I'm not sure that I want to do that. I can understand that we might do that as a consumer. But the Lord is calling us to something higher. And that is to, to reach out to those that are feeling very much like us. Um, if you go, um, if you sometime come with us to Israel, we go to Magdala, and there's this beautiful, uh, super size painting of the woman touching the hem of the Savior's garment. And in that sense of being marginalized, and she's marginalized on the side of the street with her issue of blood, and she's just reaching out to grab the hem. It gives you some idea. She's grabbing the, the tassels off of his tallit, of his prayer shawl. And she's reaching out to touch that. And the painter gave it just a little bit of a glow as it, as it touched. How many people do you know that are sitting on the margins of the ward and they're just hanging on to a little bit of a hem? and are feeling like they don't like attending church very much either, but maybe they have no place else to go. Maybe they're doing it out of tradition or guilt or whatever. But they're those on the margins. And how we minister to those on the margins is, is in many, many, many ways the essence of what was said over and over and over in the Old Testament. The Psalms, Proverbs, Isaiah is all about what are you doing with serving those on the margins. And sometimes they don't smell very well. And sometimes they're not very socially inept. Or maybe they're very socially inept. How are we taking care of them? So, questions. In my ward, who my, if I'm not sure I want to be there, or ward is a, my ward is a struggle, or it's cliquish, or clannish, or it just doesn't do a good job of serving others, who might be feeling exactly the way that I am? And do I approach that as a consumer and walk away and leave them? Or do I approach it as a servant with, with my heart open and and looking and sensing those feeling like I do. Who do I see hanging on to the hem of the ward? 
up through the crowd just trying to hold on and we have no idea the battle they went through that week just to get there and what's swirling in their soul as they're listening to looking at perfect families walking into the ward and they feel they will never understand that or be like that finally who in my ward do I have a hard, harder time loving? Because that might be your challenge. It might be the next, next uh, class you've got to teach alongside. In a crazy sort of way, the Lord sort of knew what he was doing when plopping us in geographical, um, challenging wards with challenging people who were there to afflict us and to teach us, and we to them. My brothers and sisters, I bear you my testimony that the Lord intends Zion to be filled with servants, not consumers. If you are thinking about walking away, if you're thinking about uh, just withholding, please don't. We need your voice, we need your heart, we need your opinion. We need your unique look on things. We need your vision to see those that other people aren't seeing. We need you and your servant heart. I bear you my testimony that the Lord intends for us uh, to be that as a community. And I leave that with you in Jesus' name. Amen.